the next speaker, I think, is post after that jump from biophysics to single cell recording and behaving animals. The, the next speaker will be Lynn Nadell, and to a somewhat a tag team, as I understand, with John O'Keefe, uh, historical perspectives on chronic recording. So the, the no, he wants I'm to take his go present This is a historical overview that John um, and I wants to put together. This and my task in this overview is the prehistory, oh, this which is to say, I'm going to try to bring you back to the 1960s. This is nice. Okay. So what it was like to be well, a graduate student or a researcher okay. interested in the hippocampus and such things roughly in, in the 1960s and early 1970s, before Jim made this transition. Now, sort of trying to bring you back to the 1960s is quite apt, you know, because... Okay, so there's Jim. All right. So... In, this notion of sort of going back to the 1960s and altering minds is, is just a joke and a metaphor, but, but actually in, in the, one of the things that was happening in the 1960s in the field of psychology, which is where a lot of this work was going on, was that actually mind was reemerging as something that one could study. There was a kind of a mind-altering you know, change in psychology in the 1960s. Up until around 1960, certainly in North America and, and, and especially in, in the United States, the mind was not really a part of the game, basically. In Canada, things were a little bit different, and that was because Hebb was there. And Hebb had an enormous influence on a lot of what this uh, a lot of the unfolding of this story. And Hebb, of course, was quite happy to talk about the mind and quite happy to talk about the physiological basis of mind and to speculate about it, but he was one of the only ones in North America who, who was happy to do that. So historically, there's been interest in the hippocampus since forever. It got its name because it reminded somebody of a seahorse. Uh, it's, it's been a structure that has been a playground. Uh, all the way from the earliest days, the hippocampus was recognized as a great place to play if you were a pharmacologist, if you were a physiologist. If you had no interest whatsoever in the hippocampus, you might still be studying it. All of that was you know, very good for those folks who wanted to study the hippocampus, uh, but it made reviewing the field a, a monster, even in the 1960s. And I see that Jim is on his way in, the man of the hour. I'm going to back up, but I'm, at least I'm going to have his picture on the screen when he gets in the room. Jim, I had just gotten started saying that the hippocampus was a playground for everybody, including physiologists and pharmacologists and anatomists and neurologists and so on. Even if they didn't care about the hippocampus, they studied it anyway. That was the early days of hippocampus. Cajal, we already saw, actually, Charles put up a slide of uh, Cajal, so another connection to Cajal, who, who with his... That's Cajal's last student, Laurenti de who, who pointed out some interesting features of hippocampal anatomy. But even... Notwithstanding that anatomy, the, the early interest in what the hippocampus was doing in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, focused on the connectivity. What was it connected to? And the assumption was the hippocampus was a part of this sort of overall limbic system structure. And, and, and partly that was driven by the fact that the anatomists had, had seen that there was a privileged input from the olfactory system to the hippocampus. So initially it was viewed as a kind of a Part of the olfactory, you know, sorry. Part of the olfactory system. Can't do that. Um, and, 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 but then came the Kluver Busey work in the 1930s that, in, in sort of lesioning in monkeys, that indicated that, that this limbic system, this, this general part of the brain, was critical for emotional stuff. So the hippocampus got included in sort of the emotional circuitry of the brain as part of the limbic system. And that's kind of where things stood in the 1930s. And then there were a series of studies in the 1940s that, that sort of knocked out the possibility that the hippocampus was specially interested in olfaction. That was clearly not the case. And things just sort of ambled along for a while. The hippocampus was still thought of as part of this emotional limbic system circuit, but no one knew quite what it did. We now know, of course, that the Kluver-Busey stuff is more closely connected to uh, amygdala, but you know, 
Try to put yourself back into the time then. Some of the interest in the, in the role of the hippocampus in emotion has come back because hippocampus, it turns out, has an enormous uh, concentration of stress receptors, and the ventral hippocampus plays an important role in certain anxiety behaviors. So there's, there is some co connection there between hippocampus and emotional behavior, but it is not as central as people thought it was back then. All right, so Hebb, however, looking at Laurenti Deneau's drawings, saw something. He saw the possibility of memory circuits. He saw the possibility of re-entrant circuitry in Laurenti Deneau's drawings. And it was those things, those, those ideas that led him to talk about cell assemblies, or that he's, he, he postulated that within those reentrant circuits, one could talk about the, the sort of regurgitation, reactivation, sort of reentrant circuitry, keeping alive ideas and thoughts in, in an animal's head. And that was, what, that was Hebb's idea. There's a quote from Hebb and so on. And these, this was the idealized version of a cell assembly that he thought he saw a version of in Laurenti de Nod's um, uh, painting, uh, Laurenti de figures. Well, it wasn't too long from then until the connection was made to memory. So, of course, I don't need to go through this story in this group. There's HM up in the top uh, left-hand corner, Sue Corkin, who sadly just uh, died uh, some months ago, uh, Brenda Milner, who is still with us, H.M., of course, died also some years ago. I'm not going to get into the controversy around the books about H.M. and all of that right now. We can talk about that later. Uh, but the point is that given H.M. in the 1950s, hippocampus and memory became connected. But the critical thing in understanding what that meant is understanding what did people mean by memory at that point in time. They did not mean by memory what we mean by memory now with, well, I mean, in some, specifically, they did not have the same views. This, you pick up any textbook, you'll still see this, because there's some truth to this kind of a figure. This was what we thought about memory in the 1960s, right? It was an information processing view with these boxes, with different sort of temporal types of memory. There was immediate memory, and there was short-term memory, and there's long-term memory. Various things happen, and that's memory. There's no multiple memory systems. None of that stuff existed at this point in time. You have to think of, put yourself into that framework in thinking about memory. HM was taken to support that sort of a view of, of information processing. So the idea about HM, in the initial work with HM in the 1950s, the assumption based on the early testing that was done with, a, with HM, and this is well documented in, in, the, in both Sue Corkin's recent book and in other places, was that he had an apparently intact short-term memory because you could give him three digits and he could repeat those back to you if he wasn't distracted. And he also had apparently intact long-term memory because he could retrieve some old memories. Now, they didn't dig very deep. And because of that, well, if you look at these boxes, he had, he had immediate memory, he had short-term memory, he had long-term memory. So what's wrong? Clearly what was wrong was the inability to get stuff from short-term memory into long-term memory, right? There was a block in that, in that transfer of information from one state to the other. And that's how the hippocampus got connected to memory consolidation. The idea that it was crucial to do that, basically. And that was what was wrong with HM. He couldn't form new memories, but he could retain old ones. We now know that actually this early view of HM's remote memory was wrong. And again, as Sue Corkin's book quite clearly documented that with more careful analysis of HM, it's clear that his, old, his remote memories are impoverished. And so that has changed the way we think about remote memory and about the role of the hippocampus in consolidation. That's not my charge today, but I just want to throw that out here. So when HM was, was discovered, or when the results of HM surgery were, were figured out, there was an immediate attempt, somewhat immediate, uh, to sort of replicate this, this memory defect in, in, in a primate model. In Montreal, in the Neurological Institute, um, Rasmussen, Orbach, Milner, and Rasmussen, I think it was that paper. And, and they, they made what they thought were comparable lesions in the monkey, comparable to what was done in HM, and they did not get anything that looked like a memory defect. And that sent the field into total turmoil. So that was what existed in, that paper was published in 1960. So what existed in, in the early 1960s was, was this apparent disjunct between the role of the hippocampus in memory in humans and we don't know what it does in animals, essentially, because it doesn't seem to be doing memory 
anything like what HM did. And that was kind of where the field was. In fact, my PhD thesis in, in, the, in the 1967 or so was aimed at trying to solve that problem. Why was there a difference between humans and animals with respect to hippocampus? Utterly failed to, to solve the problem. Got me a PhD, which is <laughs> all that it needed to do, apparently. Um, anyway, why did, the, why did those early attempts <coughs> fail? Uh, now we know, in hindsight, there, we were using different tasks. They were not the same. And this plays into the multiple memory idea. It wasn't, it, we now know in retrospect that maybe we were not thinking about the anatomy in quite the right way, which were the right bits of the brain. And we also had, as I've just tried to show you, not a very sophisticated notion of how memory was organized in the brain. So it's not surprising. So, but there was another reason why animal models didn't apply in the 1960s to the sort of memory model, you know, the kind of the memory idea didn't apply to animals in the 60s, was that in the 1960s, I, th this may come as a shock to you, but apparently in the 1960s, me animals didn't have memories. I mean, they have only developed the ability to have memories in the last 20 or 30 years. <laughs> That's a joke. In, in, in the 1960s, the, 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 in the, especially in, no in North America, and in particular in the United States, the, the, the kind of impact of Hull remained. And so everything was still talked about in highly behaviorist terms, pretty much everywhere. This was not the case in Canada, not the case at McGill, not the case in the UK, was the case in the United States. So animals didn't have memories. So how could you have a memory deficit? What they did was that they learned and they had habits and so on. And this was the way one talked about animal behavior in the 1960s in most places. It's very hard to put yourself into that mindset, but that was where we were. Right? However, other things were going on. So in Europe, I want to mention a few other things that were part of the mix that, w that existed at the time in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, when a lot of this was happening. So one, one, one piece here was the contribution by uh, Jung, who discovered uh, theta waves. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Andrei Grashjan, who, well, where's Yuri? Yuri's out of the room. Andrei Grashjan was one of the first to investigate the role of the hippocampus in classical conditioning in, in sort of Pavlovian-like circumstances, right? Not surprising being in Hungary, right? Also, Olga Vinogradova did very important work in these, she was the first to record single units, right, from awake animals while testing behavioral responses. She published a very important work in, in the 60s, and her focus was on the role of the hippocampus as part of Sokolov's neuronal model. So I don't know how many of you know about any of this kind of history, but of course, back in the 60s, again, there was no memory, not here, but in the Soviet Union, apparently animals had memories, and, and they, according to Sokolov, they formed these neuronal models, what else, you, what's a memory but a neuronal model, of the world that, that allowed them to detect novelty. And so Sokolov was interested in the orienting response. And Vinogradova took over that work. And then, so the, here was a connection between, very important, a connection between the hippocampus and novelty. This was, this was an important part of the zeitgeist, you might say. It was emerging, but emerging from this Eastern European work. A little, I just want to add a few notes about uh, theta waves. Uh, two programs sort of picked up some of the interest in theta waves in these early days. One of them was Jeffrey Gray. Jeffrey Gray was, a, was an Oxford psychologist. He was really kind of a Renaissance man. I don't know how many of you knew him. He was, uh, but he was working, he was one of the exceptions in the UK, working kind of within a Hullian framework, a post-Hullian framework. And, he, and at that time in the, in, the, in the sort of 60s and 70s, when Hull and his, and his devotees were desperately trying to save his theory, they talked about frustration. So what is frustration? How many, this is an interesting phrase. Frustration, well, we all know what frustration is, but from a scientific point of view, frustration is, was defined as what happens when an animal doesn't get what it expects. But how do you use the word expect when animals don't have memories or brain models? So you couldn't quite use that language. So they talked about, well, what actually happens is that animals have these things called a fractional anticipatory frustrative, I mean, it's arcane stuff. Right? But they had figured out some way, and then Jeffrey Gray tacked onto that and, and, and assumed that, that certain specific frequency bands of the theta rhythm corresponded to particular states of frustration or not frustration. 
He'd made a direct link between the theta and these kinds of interesting aspects of behavior that nobody fully understood, and so on. And actually, John, you probably, John undoubtedly remembers this or probably tried to repress it. We went and gave a talk in 1973, was it? There was, a, there was that meeting in Sussex that Richard Morris organized, 70, yes, 72 or 73, and Jeffrey Gray was there, and it was all meant to be talking about behavioral stuff. And, and then we, we put this talk together, and I, he, I don't know, I think he tricked me into giving the talk because it was quite unpleasant to Jeffrey Gray, and because and he probably wanted to stay in the UK, and Jeffrey was important, and I didn't care. So anyway, so we had our in, interesting interactions with Jeffrey, and, and this was a non-starter. I mean, the idea that it was a non-starter amongst other reasons that the, the, the error, the measurement error in measuring theta was greater than the, dis the difference between the different bands that he was referring to as having behavioral significance. I mean, it was, it was completely implausible. And I said as much, which didn't make him very happy. It took a few years before we talked again. Uh, uh, Case Van der Waal took up theta in a much more productive way. And I'm going to leave that to John. John, you're talking about Case. You'll say a word or two. So, so Case uh, and Case's students then advanced the field enormously in thinking about theta. All right, so early work in this time period, 1960s, animal hippocampus, have no idea what it does. The early work in rats, when people started to do rat lesion work, like me, the early work focused on discrimination learning and avoidance learning. And the general outcome of that early work was that there was no general memory impairment, as we had already seen. And the hypothesis emerged that animals with hippocampal damage can't stop doing something that they have been doing, right? The so-called response inhibition hypothesis. Some of you have probably, you know, it's like historical, of some historical interest. So what does this idea mean? It means that an animal has some tendency, either learned tendency or inborn tendency to do something, and, and the hippocampus is important in, allow, in, in, in helping the animal stop doing that so that it can do something else. And if you don't have a hippocampus, you can't sort of inhibit your responses. That was the way people talked about the hippocampus in the early 1960s. A lot of that involved work with, with a paradigm like passive avoidance. So here there's a kind of a natural tendency to step down from an open place and to get away from it or to go from a light place to a dark place. These are apparent inborn tendencies. And, a, and if you make a lesion in the hippocampus, animals are impaired at this ability, mostly. Most of the results seemed to indicate that. So here we were. 1960s, early 1970s, this notion of response inhibition, and the predominant movers of this idea, there's an arc to this history, the predominant movers of this idea were a couple of people who happened to be at Michigan, which is where our man of the hour was. So I sp when I put this talk together, I said, now it had to be the case that this fellow over here on the right, this is Bob Isaacson, who was pretty well known already in the 1960s, uh, he must have had some influence on Jim. And the way he thought must have influenced the way Jim, when he finally did get interested in the hippocampus, kind of influenced the way he thought about it. And I asked Jim last night, and he said, well, we exchanged a few sentences a couple of times. <laughs> but it's not clear how much influence there was. But for somebody coming into the hippocampus and the behavior of the hippocampus from outside the that world, it would have been impossible not to have been influenced by this way of thinking and to be focused on the behavior of the animal. Nothing abstract, the behavior of the animal. Okay, just about done. The spatial story begins to emerge at about this point in the 1970s. So John and John, John and the, the O'Keefe and Dostrovsky paper in 1971, the spatial story begins to emerge. Isaacson had another student. Dave Olton, who was very interested in that story. And he, of course, developed the radial maze. Dave died way too young, made important contributions that still matter today. All right, so there was, that's how the radial maze emerged. But at the same time, another piece of the zeitgeist was LTP. So in the early 1970s, while all this thinking about what the hippocampus is doing was going on, LTP emerged, and LTP emerged in the work of Bliss and Lomo and Gardner Medwin and a few, a few other people first in hippocampal slices, in hippocampal slices. And at that time, it was possible to sort of say to yourself, wow, the hippocampus has this special mechanism for synaptic plasticity, the only place in the brain maybe. That's it. Bingo. 
Memory, hippocampus, strong, strong kind of connection again to memory and hippocampus came from the, from the very existence of LTP at that point only shown in hippocampus. However, there were other things going on too. The space, you will not be surprised to hear, maybe you will be, that the spatial story had its share of uh, unbeliever, unbelievers, disbelievers, cynics, call them what you will, especially in North America. Um, so the response inhibition story continued during the 70s. It morphed in various ways, came out in different forms, but they, they basically didn't do any better in explaining the data. They didn't make a hell of a lot of sense. There was one other approach. This is kind of now filling in the remainder of the prehistory, and that was the approach of looking at the hippocampus with respect to the acquisition of classical conditioning. And this kind of got a push from, from Izzy Gormazano at Iowa, who had reintroduced you know, Pavlovian eye blink conditioning as a really good model system for studying learning and memory. And Dick Thompson picked it up and plunked it into the hippocampus and found if you, if you condition a rabbit while you're recording hippocampal units and hippocampal activity, it looks like the hippocampal electrophysiological activity somehow matches or mirrors the actual behavior, the emergence of the behavior. We now know there's an awful lot more going on there. That's not quite what they thought it was. But there was this kind of contending view that the hippocampus was critical for these kinds of things not, and not about space. But, and here's, I really am finishing. The question is, even in the, in the work by Dick Thompson, but also in the spatial work, what exactly were the single units reflecting? Again, put your mind back 1970, early 1970s, most people reacted to the, to the play cell story with like, what the hell? I mean, what's, what drives them? I mean, what, this is pretty abstract. How does that happen, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. The same thing could have been said about the conditioning work. So now we come to Jim's point here. So in 1979, Jim very presciently said, we must know the behavioral correlates of entorhinal cortex and dentate, and you could add other structures, before we can start to argue the function of the hippocampus from single cell data. This was 1979. So Jim was already by now, and, Jim, and John will tell more of this history, quite happily, uh, quite happy with the spatial hypothesis, but still insisting if we really want to know what these place cells are doing, we've got to study the stuff that feeds into them. Right? That was, and that was the context, I'm guessing, in which Jim attacked the hippocampus, which was to look at the inputs. What is it, what is it getting, basically? All right? And, but now, with this new work, I'm assuming there was a new zeitgeist. Now we're talking in the early 1980s, John will pick this story up, now it was possible to talk and think about spatial representations and other things, maybe making it easier for Jim and his colleagues, Bob Muller and John Kuby and others, to sort of find the head direction cells and to see them for what they were. Anyway, I'm gonna pass the torch. That's, just, that's the prehistory. That was what people thought about the hippocampus back then. And that was the confusion that existed in the field sort of up until the point when the spatial story emerged. That didn't clarify things immediately, but you know, we, know, we, know, we know most of the rest of the history. John will fill us in on the good details. <laughs> <laughs>